everyone, this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. It's my passion to share stories of amazing legal ladies who are working as in-house legal counsel, who have law firm roles, who are leading on boards and who are doing law differently. From time to time, I will also invite special guests on the show to share their insights on legal recruiting and tips for getting hired as a successful lawyer in Japan. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Lawyer On Air podcast. In this episode, I share with you another diverse story of a woman lawyer working in Japan. I'm Catherine, the host of the show, and I'm a lawyer based in Tokyo for more than 20 years, and I love helping unlock the wisdom of the stories that women lawyers never tell. What I've learned in my career in law so far is everyone makes mistakes, and there is no such thing as being perfect. What's important is you set up processes to check your work and other team members work. Those are the words of my guest today, Anitha Henderson. Anitha is an e-discovery attorney who focuses on managing Japanese language projects for cross-border litigation and for internal investigations. Her work includes starting from consulting clients and law firms, designing the most efficient workflows, managing reviewers, running AI analysis and doing everything needed to make sure the project gets done on time, in budget and at a high quality. She is fluent in Japanese and does 99% of her work in Japanese. So much so that Anitha actually joked this podcast was probably the most English she has spoken in weeks. Well, in her free time, Anitha also says she loves to watch TV, She plays casual video games, she keeps up with her favorite idol groups, and she collects anime trading cards, and she also loves to spend time with her host family in Kyoto and in traveling. You can check out Anitha's full bio in the show notes. On this episode, Anitha shares about the benefits of an extensive first career before going into law and how you can be more settled and responsive as a mature person going into your second career in the legal industry. She also shares her view that building trust with your colleagues is key to being a successful part of a workplace. Letting people know that no question is stupid and anything they ask will be answered has been key to Anitha creating a trust ecosystem in her company. Anitha also shares her views on the future of AI, such as ChatGPT, and its use in the work of lawyers, as well as providing some great tips to working successfully in Japan. She's a veteran here of over 20 years, and her tips may not be rocket science, but they are critical to working well and happily in Japan. And Anitha also shares her favorite books. She has read and reread The Person She Would Most Like to Meet, and something you might not know about her, as well as some other fun facts. Let's get into it. Hello, Anitha, and welcome to the show. Good morning, Catherine. How are you doing this morning? A little bit (laughs) sleepy, but I'm all right. This will wake you up, okay? (laughs) Okay. I know sometimes it's very early in the morning when we record the podcast. I thank you so much for coming on the show. And we always have a starting question that's exactly the same for every guest. If we were meeting up in person, where would we be? Do you have a favorite place you like to go, a restaurant, cafe, wine bar, anywhere? And what would be your choice of beverage off the menu? Mm. So I was thinking about this and... The pandemic has unfortunately changed a lot of the local restaurants that I used to always go to before the pandemic. Um, A lot of them have shut down. But one that has stayed the same is there's a little Italian restaurant called Al Cepo. And the the main staff person is is super sweet when 
in their original location, if I was coming home from work and I was really tired, I'd ask him if I could pick, take out my laptop and I could eat dinner. It was a very delicious Italian dinner, but I could also work at the same time. So I didn't have to feel guilty about taking time to do the delicious Italian dinner. So I always appreciated that they were very kind about that. And the food is amazing and seasonal. Um, so if I were taking you out to a, a local restaurant, that would be my my recommendation. Oh, um, lovely. Yes. Carry on. What do you choose from that menu then? Uh, so they, they have a seasonal menu. So it kind of depends on what whatever it is of the season. So I tend to try go for pastas that I haven't tried before, but I try to avoid because I don't drink alcohol. So I try to avoid things that are like penny al vodka or something like that. But um, any, anything else, I'd, I'll just try whatever I haven't tried before. And what do you normally then match with your pasta? Don't tell me. It's Coca-Cola, right? Come on. They don't actually serve Coca-Cola in that restaurant. Unfortunately, I wish they did. Um, I think they do like a blood orange juice. A blood um, orange juice. Okay. I'm only teasing you because I know you do. You were probably the biggest shareholder in Coca-Cola with the amount that you. I wish I did own some, <laughs> some shares, actually. I've often thought that. But um, certainly people around me have a high, higher level of drinking Coca-Cola because they see me drinking it. But ah. if. If they did serve Coca-Cola, I would have that, absolutely. Right. They just don't right. happen to, yeah. Thank you so much. That's really great. And I hope we can go there and have some seasonal dish together. That would be super fun. Well, if you think back to your early days, Anitha, when you were a child or a young adult, what kinds of careers were you thinking about or dreaming about? Maybe something that you wanted to do in the future. So I've never been someone who had a very clear sense of, I want to do this kind of job. Um, I always thought about what kind of lifestyle I'd like to have. So when I was a kid, I, I read, I still read a lot, but I, I read just so many books. I practically lived in the library. So I always wanted to have like a big house with the the kind of library where it's like walls and walls and walls and walls of books and all of my favorite books would be there and be just this wonderful, relaxing room. I think I just kind of want to be retired for the rest of my life. I didn't have a very clear sense of, and that was a sense of a source of anxiety for me because everyone else had these clear, you know, dreams and things they wanted to do, but I wasn't very sure about that. Isn't that so? Like when I was at school, what I wanted to be was someone who worked in a stationery shop mm. because I just love to and I think you're probably the similar is put my nose in a book and smell the ink <laughs> <laughs> and that made me think oh well working in a stationery shop where there's books and all sorts of paper that would be a perfect place for me so mm. I didn't have that moment so if someone asked me this exact question mm -hmm. I would say exactly what I just said then like you I didn't have some I want to be and one, I wonder often times why that is, why say you or I did not have that. No, it, it could be that the role models around me weren't necessarily jobs that I would want to do. So my father was a scientist um, and my mother is an audiologist. So neither of those are particularly careers that I wanted to go into. There when you see science, science sounds very cool on paper. I think it sounds a lot cooler on paper, but when you have to get down to the work, it's a lot of you know daily grind, research and writing grant papers and all of that. My father did enjoy it, but he also advised against going into that. So it's hard to imagine what kind of positions are there out there when you don't have that necessarily around in your in your life. That's so right. Yeah. And I know there was a careers room at school and I went in there and looked at brochures and nothing really popped out. So I have no mm -hmm. idea how I became a lawyer in the end, but <laughs> it's a big story. It's actually very interesting to sort of ponder on this topic of the role models that we have and who influences us on our way. And I wonder for you, when did being a lawyer then come up? Did someone influence you or did you find some inspiration somewhere there for you to come into the world of law? Even when I was in law school, my friend was like, do you even want to be a lawyer? Um, I had no thoughts of being a lawyer even when I was in law school. So I did a, a joint degree program, um, a joint MBA and a law, law school degree. I was an undergraduate business student. So I had wanted to do my MBA 
And when I was looking at all the different programs I was offered um, at that time in my life, if I did the joint degree, I would graduate just before I turned 30. And I thought a lot about it. And I thought that if I did an MBA and a law school degree together, that my opportunities would be increased. And so since I didn't know what I wanted to do, in theory, at least, um, I would have more opportunities if I had more of these. You know, law is such a multidisciplinary uh, field. You know, you can go pursue different avenues. And it seemed like a good idea on paper. I won't necessarily say that it ended up that way. But even throughout law school, I don't know that I ever had a sense of, I want to be a lawyer. I was continually looking for opportunities outside of the law. I ended up finding a job as a as a lawyer, as opposed to just being a regular business person. I found a job as a lawyer and I just continued it that way. So I don't think there was a clear idea of, I want to be a lawyer. Right. Almost ever, actually. But you still did law, right? So it's not always the case that people who do law want mm-hmm. to be a lawyer or think they could ever be one, but they somehow do law in a way like you've just explained that it keeps your options very wide open when you've combined it with something else as well. So in the United States, there's a lot of people who go through law school and um, they ultimately don't end up being lawyers for their entire career. They tend to find something that really interests them, that really um, is their true passion, and they go towards that. So you definitely see a lot of people shifting off the lawyer path. In my case, I found this industry and and I've I've stuck with it. Yes, you have. And I know you're working in e-discovery right now, but Mm -hmm. just before when you said you'd have a joint degree before 30, Mm -hmm. I'm sure people who are listening will think, huh, that, that means she was doing something before. Mm. And I think that whole before bit for you is super interesting because you came to Japan early in your life, right? You were studying as a Monbosho scholarship recipient and also some other things there earlier on in your career. So let's come back to law a little in a little bit, but tell me about those founding days because that really got you on your path, I think, to being a real dedicated lover of Japan and working here. The MOBA Show scholarship it was something I was very grateful to receive, but that was quite late in my educational career. I was already um, past law school and, and past the bar exam and all of that. So that was actually the last educational thing I did um, in Japan. So I started off in college. Um, I started studying Japanese. I Why started... did you do that? Why did you study Japanese? I'm a huge anime fan, as you know, and I started that in high school. Uh, is a big thing for me in high school. And when I got into college, I thought high school is so restrictive in, in, in what you can learn. Whereas my university was a big, giant public uh, state school. So you could study anything. And I thought, you know, I should take this opportunity to study anything that I want to study. And I still feel today that I really hate studying anything I don't want to study, especially when I'm paying the tuition. So I started studying Japanese uh, my freshman year of, uh, do you say freshman year? That's a very American thing, but I'm (laughs) used to it now. Don't worry, I've become more global. So I understand freshman, but does that actually mean first year? That does mean your first year. You're fresh, right? You're fresh. You're fresh. Right. Yes. But your junior year is your third year, so that's kind of. Um, oh, is that right? I didn't know yes. that. Junior year is your third year. What's your second year? Sophomore year. A oh, sophomore. That's that sophomore thing. Got it. Okay. Mm. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure because I know that you're not from the same. Exactly. Country. Yes. I love um, the American way of describing your education. I All right. I realize how unusual it is to to describe it that way because I think Canadians also do not do it. Yeah. It's an, it's a really American thing to call yourself a freshman and then to be a junior in your third year. That's mm-hmm. an interesting thing. And I'm mm. also interested that fresh man has stayed and nothing's changed no, and no. modified over the years. So anyway, we digress, but thank you for that education. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very important uh, American yes. linguistics there. Um, okay. Yeah. So I started studying my freshman year, my second year, my sophomore year, I studied abroad at Kansai Gaida University, which is out in Osaka Prefecture. And after I I just fell in love with Japanese. 
Um, and I'd still, I love communicating in Japanese. I love, I just thought this is something I want to do my entire life. Not that every time that you, you feel that way, it ends up being true, but it's 20 plus years later and I still love it very much. So I just had that very strong feeling. So when I graduated university, I just knew I wanted to come back to Japan. And I feel it's quite common for people who have studied Japanese, but I went on the JET program, which is a government sponsored program to find English teachers. And if you can speak Japanese, you can work for the city halls or the local authorities um, and get employed at just sort of various local authorities all across the country. I worked for an international association in Kitakyushu for two years. And my job was to develop programs for the, I think if a school wanted a program on globalization, for example, they would send us a request. I'd design a program based on what they need. And I'd go and, and lecture there for like half an hour or an hour. A lot of playing with kids, a lot of public speaking, which was very nerve wracking um, initially, but it was fun. And I love Kyushu um, as a result. And I definitely didn't feel that I wanted this experience to end. So after my two years, there's a sort of term limit of three years. So after my two years, I ended up being an English teacher for an DABA, which is a English conversation school here. And I worked in Osaka as an English teacher for two years, which was really, really, really fun. You learn so much about how to convey information in a way that someone else can understand easily in the small amount of time you have. And I find that's a skill that's been really helpful in my career later on because, you know, you had to break down these complex topics for people um, so that they can understand even if they don't have a background in it. So I've definitely felt that that experience has just been so helpful in, in my in my life and it was a huge amount of fun. So I had those four years of experience, of work experience before I went to law school which for my law school was a little bit unusual. Most of the students went into law school straight out of college. So I definitely had a very different perspective towards everything than my classmates. I think they were a little bit more, um, you know how it's so competitive in, in law school. It's it's so, you know, who's going to get the first first grades? Who's going to get this or, or, or that? And of course, that is very important. It's important to try your best and, and show show your work. But I think I was a little bit more relaxed about it than my peers. I think just because I had a working perspective person, like I didn't have the same sense of this is live or die situation. I think I was a little bit more chill about those kind of things. Yeah. But I definitely I, didn't have that perspective when I went to law school and to my MBA. Well, MBA is a little bit different. but Yes. You have really hit on a good point there of, having a chance to work before you actually go into university. And I think I didn't really realize that that was a possibility in the States as well, but certainly it is in New Zealand where I was. And I had done work previously before coming into law school as well. And I think it just makes you more relaxed. Yes. Uh, and even though it's, you know, coming doing law is never a relaxing thing, but it's the maturity of yourself having been out in the world and what that brings to your study and your ability to concentrate perhaps as well and uh, devote yourself to your studies it's a different thing to working totally but there's something about having been out in the world that makes it a little bit easier to be mature towards your study yes like on the one hand I was much more relaxed about this is not a live or die situation but on the other hand I had a little less patience for for example we we had a study group and if you were not prepared for the study group, even though everyone else was prepared, that, that kind of irritated me a little bit. Um, you know, everyone else is bringing their, their A game. You should also bring your A game and not waste anybody else's valuable time. Oh, so true. So true, right? You've done it and um, others haven't. It really is frustrating because it lets down the class. And that just happens through life the whole time, right? You get into office meetings and people haven't prepared for it. Or you're getting mm -hmm. to a conference and people haven't prepared and you you have or others haven't and some have and some haven't. And it's just a thing that happens through life, I believe. I think I have, as I've, as I've gotten older, have to let go of some of that irritation. But I think I was quite intense about it in law school, <laughs> unfortunately, for my study group. 
Well, I loved, yeah, I loved how you've just brought out a whole lot of things there with your career that you did before going into law. And what I really enjoyed hearing you say was how you were a teacher and it helped you to convey information to people in a way that they could understand easily. And quite often it's easy to undermine or underrate uh, teachers in Japan. And I think this is the skill that they end up having. And I think it's been very instrumental for you and the kind of work that you're doing now, absolutely. And I'm sure in your first years as a lawyer, and I know we're moving around your life here, and I hope people are catching up and staying in play with what we're saying. But what happened then? Let's go back to your first years as a, as a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Um, you hadn't really thought about being a lawyer when you're at law school, but what were some of the things that happened there that were good, you know, highs and lows, things that didn't go so well or challenges in those first few years. Did you grow to kind of like being a lawyer? E-discovery is a very unique field in the sense that there's a lot of it that is just project management as opposed to providing counsel for clients. So in that sense, there's some people who feel that it's not really being a lawyer. You don't necessarily have a sense of being a lawyer necessarily every single day because you're just handling um, whatever issues that come up that day. My first project when I graduated uh, law school started the weekend immediately after I took the bar. So I wasn't even barred yet when I started it. In many ways, it was fortunate, but at the time, we didn't have someone on scene leading us. We had to sort of figure it out ourselves. So (laughs) we were on this new job. And there's 30 or 40 of us. Um, It's extremely complicated project with lots of complicated rules. And we have to sort of figure it out for ourselves. And I ended up quickly taking a a leadership position, even though it was my first thing out of school. So we were working with both lawyers and non-lawyers who could also speak Japanese and English fluently. Just sort of managing that project, making sure that everyone has the same level of information. And everyone is applying the information in the same way to the task at hand and making sure that everyone gets along very well. And there were some people who didn't like each other necessarily. And all of those things, I found I ended up using a lot of the skills I learned both from the law and also from the MBA side in managing that that project. So I felt that I grew a lot as a person in that first project because I had to think not of myself, but of my team. It's a very stressful thing to do, but I knew it would achieve the best kind of results. I was working in the United States, but I was working with a lot of uh, people of Japanese origin as well. So I knew that a more and more American approach would, would not necessarily go over well. So I tried to be very humble about it and be like, hey, what do you think about this? I'd like to consult you about that. But what I really want them to do is just sort of fix whatever problem that they have caused um, and try to be really, really respectful of everyone and, and, and appreciative of everybody's skills. So I think that was a really good thing about that project. And that lasted for me um, half a year before I was a fortunate recipient of the Mobile Scholarship. And I studied at KO Law School as a research student for a couple of years. Wow, oh, it's amazing, isn't it? That I'm having a feeling of that less patience thing come up you didn't have patience for everyone maybe in that group of 30 who were all sort of wandering around perhaps like sheep and they needed a shepherd and you were the one that came along and out of that patience or frustration lack of patience and frustration (laughs) you were the one that stood up as a young you know not even barred officially right taking the lead Mm -hmm. that's incredible so a lot of the Japanese people that we're working with us were older people so they had lots of you know talent and brilliance and in in their own fields, but maybe they couldn't use the computer as well as they wanted to, or use the software as well as they wanted to. So, sort of tried to come at it from a place of I really respect this person and I want to mm. not be so irritated. I think being irritated at someone is not a doesn't lead to good things. I've never really found good things happening from me being irritated. That's yeah, fine. you can be irritated, feel it, and have the less patience, but you never bring that out. You use it in a different way, as you say, to respect mm-hmm. the other side and and not be irritated and, you know, ask questions as you were doing and respect that Japanese language and culture as you went along in your work. Yeah, definitely. 
Amazing. So then why did you decide to do a KO scholarship, the Monbisho scholarship after having started doing law? Did you just have this urge to do more Japanese? <laughs> Well, I always wanted to go back to Japan. The Momosho Scholarship is a very prestigious, I mean, it's a very big scholarship. They pay for all of the tuition and they pay for a little bit of a stipend as well. So I just applied for it on the hopes that I could get in. I did. I did, had always loved um, Keo a lot. And I'm not sure if you, you know him, but there used to be a professor called Professor Jared McAllen. Um, he was in Japan for a very, very long time. I had studied at Temple University at their Japan campus for a semester during when I was in law school. And Professor McAllen was one of my professors, and he said he would sponsor me. And that ended up being a big plus on my application, because I think they're concerned about students that don't have a position already um, in their their graduate schools, they're pretty interdisciplinary. So I studied law, but that was unusual. It's mostly a lot of STEM engineering students, people who are going to go into graduate level science, study of science. Um, I could have pursued it up to a PhD, I think. Wow. I ended up not doing that. Yeah, yeah. my professor, he was not, he, he didn't quite understand that, but I hated being <laughs> a student. Yeah, I hate not working. Yeah, so you wanted to work, but you also wanted to study and you wanted to do this prestigious scholarship and you got there, right? And so, you know, often I think professors may not understand when we don't want to go as far as they have gone uh, and mm. further, but you, you know, stuck to what you wanted to do. And so was that one year or a couple of years? It was two years as a research right. student. Right. And what happened after that? After that, I went back to working on projects, and then I really wanted to come back to Japan. And I went into a Japanese language school. So I enrolled with them for, I think, one year. And a few months into it, I started working part-time at my current company because they needed someone to work on a project, and they were willing to agree to letting me only work in the mornings which is not something I have seen happen since I have been employed with them. But at the time, I think they were desperate. And so they were letting me work in the morning. So I'd work in the mornings at the company and I'd come to back to school in the evenings. And eventually my company did end up hiring me and I've been there for, this is my sixth year. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, how did you actually find that work though? Were you looking around for something and it came up? Or did someone introduce you to that work? Because it's a really interesting area of work and we're about to talk about it. But just how did you find it in the first place? So there are very few uh, vendors who do that work. There are a lot of law firms that do it internally, I believe. And this um, is e-discovery work, yes. E-discovery work, mm -hmm. yes. But as a vendor doing it, there are only about four companies that do it. So I actually you know, sent in my application to all of those those different ones. And they were the ones that responded the most positively. I think at that time, my predecessor was looking for another job. So that was just a timing thing. Also, that they needed someone at the time I needed to be em employed. So it just worked out that way. Yeah. And that is often how things happen, isn't it? It's And it's almost like, I feel you don't find the job, the job finds you. This work has to be done by Anitha. I'm going to make sure the opportunity comes up that she can do it, which is great. And so as an e-discovery attorney, you focus on managing Japanese language projects for cross-border litigations and internal investigations. So you told me, what do you like about this work? For someone who's listening, who's really curious, who's tapped on this podcast and started to listen about this role that you've got, what is it? Why would someone else want to be interested in it? What do you have to do to be good at this kind of work? Any tips and advice there? Big question. I'm not sure how it is for a normal lawyer job because I've only really done this. But I think what it takes to be successful in our field is it's extremely team-based. So are you communicating well with your team? Do you know what the workflows are? Do you know where the risks are? Are you handling those risks appropriately? Have you taken uh, some kind of strategy in? So, for example, uh, 
we had recently a case that was had some Chinese language issues. So we had to bring on people who could read Chinese. And I don't read Chinese, unfortunately. Um, I can just kind of get a feeling from the characters, but I obviously don't read Chinese. So I knew that there were going to be communication issues because this person is going to have to, I still have to check the work. So this person has to communicate what they are reading in, in Chinese to me, and I need to be able to make a judgment based on that. So there's a quality risk in that inherent quality risk. So I had set up in the workflows that I designed, I set up little stop points and I'll check in with the person and be like, hey, what's up with this document? What's up with this thing? Um, so I think teamwork is huge in, in e-discovery because it's so easy to to make mistakes, um, so easy for those mistakes to not get caught by anybody else. So having a really good workflow, having checks and balances in place, communicating with your team, who are all, you know, most of them are not lawyers. I'm the only lawyer on my, in my company working on the vendor side. I understand what the client is doing and what the the law firm, the, our client law firm is trying to do. But to our project managers or process engineers, you know, it's not necessarily very clear. They received the instructions and they know how to do what they are instructed to do because they have that skill. But they don't necessarily understand the, the background uh, behind it. So I think for someone to be successful in our our field, communication is huge. Teamwork is huge. Wanting to protect your team, I think, is is a big, big thing. It's not just every man for themselves. Right. So I think yeah. those are very big. Yeah, those are very big. And it goes back to what you said before, too, with your workflows and aspects around that, that you have to be able to explain things very easily to both your clients and customers but also mm. internally so that the team is behind you. Yeah, we find that, so all of our clients are big clients. We're a Japanese vendor. So our clients are major Japanese corporations um, all across the, the country. Although mostly in, in Tokyo, but we do have a lot of consulting clients and some based on other places. So we find that they know that they have to do this this kind of project, this kind of investigation, but they don't necessarily understand so in the U.S., there are a lot of international corporations that are sort of repeat clients. They really know the workflow. They really know what they want to do and how to do it effectively. But here it's still new and developing. So there are some amazing people who who really know their stuff uh, in Japan. But a lot of the clients, it's, it's new to them. So we have to take the position of being the expert and explain it so that they understand and they know why they have to spend all of this money on this this project and, and why it costs so much. Unfortunately, it does quite cost quite a little mm, bit. Yeah. And what, what do you particularly like about this e-discovery work? I really like that it's project-based. I mean, I think most lawyerly work is is project-based in that sense. But, you know, every day is different. I've been at my company for five years in one month. <laughs> and But I, I don't think that any, any case has been, there's no case that's been easy. Even the little cases that, you know, are only a week or a few days. There's always something challenging about it. It's just different. There's always a challenge. Um, the pandemic brought a big challenge because we had to move. We went from on-site to remote completely. And so how do we prepare the computers? How do we provide the equipment? How do we even contact people or communicate with people? It's it's a big difference between communicating with them on-site where I can just scribble on a whiteboard. Uh, there's no whiteboard online. Figuring out how to deal with those communication issues, it's just always something new in every every case. And right. I find that really, yeah, really valuable. That pandemic would have thrown in a few challenges. Is there anything else outside of the pandemic that makes work challenging or things that have happened that you've overcome that you've thought, wow, I did that. I did a really good job on that. So one thing that was surprising, so I had come into this from doing this kind of work in the United States and working with other Americans and people who were Americans, but they were of Japanese origin. And when I came to Japan and started working with people who grew up in Japan and had lived in Japan, and, and they were the now the review team, the people we hire on contract to work on each individual project. I found that this is a little bit of a cultural thing, but I found that they were very, very shy, extremely shy, and they didn't want to ask me questions. 
that I needed them to ask me questions so I could confirm that their understanding of the rules and the way that they were doing the work was correct. So I needed that communication to be open, but they were not going to come to me and ask me questions. They would just spend the whole day in almost silence and just not ask me anything unless they were really desperate and they really needed an answer to something. So I found working on that communication, making sure that they know that they can trust me. There's no question that is a stupid question, right? Right. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. No question is stupid. No question is a stupid question, but it's very hard for people to walk up to someone and open their mouth and say something that they not are not sure is a stupid question. You know, how will the other person think? How will my coworkers think about it? Um, I don't want to look bad. Let me just quietly do my work here. So making sure that they understood that there's no such thing as a stupid question, that I will take any question um, and, you know, respond to them respectfully and fully and in a way that they will understand. And so they can trust me enough to ask me the questions and opening up that communication was a lot of individual work um, on my part. So I would talk to each person in- individually, especially in the beginning. Um, I would go and sit next to them and be like, hey, do you have any questions? How was this? How was that? Um, just having little quiet conversations with each person and making sure that they're each each of their concerns was dealt with. So I came to think that really what everyone wants to do is a good job. And they know that if they are misunderstanding something, that leads to not such a great job. So my job is to make sure that they have the tools to do that. And part of that is making sure it's open communication. And if someone is really genuinely too embarrassed to sort of talk in front of the class, then I should take the time to talk to them individually and make sure that they have a space that they can feel comfortable in and ask questions. Right. So you don't dismiss them because they're not answering the question. You create a place where they can feel comfortable to do that. And I definitely feel that that has been a big difference in our company as well. So in before I came along, there wasn't that much communication between the manager and the the individual uh, contract and employees. But I have definitely set that up as a standard. And I think our, our reviewing managers, as they come in now, they also follow the same same way. So we're much, we have a much closer relationship with our, with our reviewers. And I think is the standard in the industry. We really know them quite well. Really? That's really great. I guess this is going to be a related question, but mm-hmm. I ask most of my guests this question now, the most important thing I've learned from my career so far is, can you finish that sentence for me? I think that everyone makes mistakes. There's no such thing as being perfect, but you do need to provide the clients with the best service that you can provide them. So you can't be perfect and you can't not make mistakes, but you can definitely set up sort of processes to check your work, to check other people's work, to provide feedback to other people, and just sort of have a reiterative process that at the end result that you provide to the client is pretty, pretty high level, high quality, very few error kind of work. But the first cut is not going to be perfect. The second cut's not going to be perfect. Everyone's going to make mistakes. So having that kind of forgiveness for yourself and forgiveness for others, because there's so many places where you can make mistakes in our our job. So that was something that my e-discovery professor, when I was in University of Florida, they told us, you know, you can't be perfect. There's just too much data. There's too much stuff. You cannot be perfect. And lawyers tend to be quite perfectionist. So so, being able to realize, hey, hey, everyone does make a mistake. No one's going to be perfect um, is definitely the most important advice that I've received in in this career. Yeah, perhaps it's that we need actually someone to tell us that that you can't be perfect. Otherwise, we believe that's the way it is, probably inherently or only because we haven't been told otherwise. Maybe that's the way it is until someone actually lets you know that it's, hey, it's okay to be not perfect. It's hard to feel safe to be imperfect. It's hard mm. to feel that it's okay to be, submit something that might have a little bit of an, an error. You definitely do need someone to say, hey, it's okay. We'll, we understand that. And we have set up 
certain workflows in place to catch all of your mistakes. So I always try to convey to my team, hey, we understand you might miss this, but I have set up this kind of check to capture all the things that you might miss. So don't worry about it. You know, do your best. I will catch your mistakes. Yeah, and that's it, isn't it? You know, I'm your backstop. You're not going to lose the game, lose the ball, whatever it is, because Mm -hmm. I'm there behind you to catch it because I've made this system such that it catches those little errors that might come through. Yeah, so in that sense, I think it's not important not also to have the system in place, but also to convey that you have that system in place. Absolutely, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. What would you then say has been perhaps in this last year your biggest lesson from the work that you've been doing and maybe to younger lawyers who could be listening to this and thinking about e-discovery as a career and even aside from that, the biggest lesson you've learned in the last year, Anitha? You know, I've learned a lot talking to you and having you as someone in my my corner. Um, So to be honest, the, the biggest change in me over the last year has been meeting you. And the reason I say that is my work is quite isolated. I'm the only lawyer in my entire company that does this kind of work. I do a lot of education from our our non-legal colleagues or colleagues that don't have a legal background. Um, So I'm always working with non-lawyers. And so it's very hard to imagine my job as as a lawyer lawyer. Most of what I do is falls under project management. There is this different sense of responsibility, for example, judgment. You know, I don't let other people override my judgment on some of the things. But it's hard to really feel like a lawyer lawyer when you're not so with other lawyers. Meeting you and interacting with other lawyers who are amazing people has really boosted my confidence as a professional my awareness of myself as a professional, as a, as a lawyer. Oh, I, I have this kind of feelings because I'm a lawyer as opposed to a non-lawyer. Or I have this kind of impression or this way of thinking because I'm a lawyer. It really helps to, to have met you and, and other such amazing people and it has given me a lot of confidence in myself. So I think that's the biggest change over the past year. So having more confidence in myself has led to me to be more proactive, I think. You know, in the pandemic, we had a sort of dormant phase. But I really feel like I've I've woken up in the past year. Mm, That's really lovely to hear. And, you know, that's what I'm all about is bringing a community together because a community didn't really exist in Japan in the way that I've tried to create it, and I'm not uh, saying that to give accolades to me. I'm just saying I needed that community, and it Mm -hmm. wasn't there, uh, where I had like-minded lawyers, women lawyers come together and be able to experience a place where they could open up and share their challenges and actually find some pathways through. It's been a real change, hasn't it, this last year, definitely. And um, thank you for saying that. That's really special to hear that uh, for me. So next question I have for you is people have seen or heard you today thinking about coming to Japan to have a career here, not necessarily Mm -hmm. anymore, but tips for successfully working in Japan. Since you have been here a long time, you really understand the culture. You love the language and are really immersed in it. What would you suggest? Maybe two or three tips for people for long-term success for working in Japan. Japan is really hard to live in in some ways and not because of obviously it's a very safe country and uh, there are some positions where you don't need to speak Japanese to to get around Uh, but I do think there are a lot of invisible rules and to people who grew up here and they sort of intuitively know all the rules that's just common sense but when you come in from the outside and you don't have that quote-unquote common sense uh, you can be regarded quite negatively because you're just uh, other people are like, but this is just good manners. Why aren't you? Why aren't you doing it this way? And you're being rude. It's quite easy to be perceived as rude. Unfortunately, I think it is important to 
be aware of those things and figure out your own balance. And it's not easy because you are adapting to the culture of culture and rules of another place. And you may not necessarily agree with all of those rules that are so broad, not just in work, but just sort of everyday life. My friend came to Tokyo recently and apparently he was he and his wife were eating on the street and they got a quite a lot of lot of looks for eating on the street. <laughs> you know? It's not a big deal. You don't have to feel too bad about it, but sure it is it is against the rules around here. And I have never thought to do it myself. But um, you know, if you really want to do it, as long as you don't cause uh, meiwaku, uh, what do you call it in English? What kind uh, of inconvenience or annoyance to someone else? Yeah, if you don't cause inconvenience to, to someone else, if you're not hurting anybody, you, know, you can you can do your own thing to some extent. Um, but you have to be aware that that the hurting other people may be quite broad in, in this country. I think that was the big hardest thing for me ingesting here but as a career professional i think the most important thing is to make sure that you can do your job really well in a way that supports the other people in in your organization so that you're not just doing it just for you but you're also building up your colleagues and your um you know your bosses and the people that work under you if you can do your job really well the quirks um, are a little I'm a lot more acceptable, I think. I definitely feel a lot of acceptance from my company to have all of my little quirks. Um, I'm the, definitely the person that brings in the Halloween treats and <laughs> randomly <laughs> sticks things on the door that are like little. I should do that actually this year. To put some Halloween signs yes, definitely. around the company. <laughs> Anything else? One more tip. I think humility is huge. A lot of Japanese culture is also that way, but um, being ha- well, maybe that's this is the case in if you were living in New Zealand or if you're living in the United States. But to to be humble is is really important. To be grateful for everything else that you can see. I think a lot of people it's it's easy to criticize certain things and not see the good things. But having a mindset of saying, oh, this is this positive thing, there is lots of valid things, valid criticisms that you can make here, certainly. But there are also a lot of wonderful things. So I think if you're going to be here a long time, you have to make sure that the positives to you, that you're able to see the positives every single day is important. You know, like it's clean, for example, the city is clean, but that's done through Every morning, there's a crew of people that are out cleaning the streets, right? The people that get up at like seven and or eight in the morning and they're you know, cleaning out the, the front part of the building to make sure that their portion of the street is clean and neat and nice for everyone else to walk in. That's a lot of work by a lot of different people. So to be appreciative of that is, I think, a, a key here it's it's just so easy to criticize and get into a negative mindset but keeping mm-hmm. a positive attitude is is really important so true that i read something today is if you keep your own doorstep clean the whole city will be clean it was mm-hmm. interesting and also you're right you know there's no trash cans or garbage cans rubbish bins whatever you call them around the city like there might be in other other cities yet japan is clean you don't see gommy right rubbish out on the streets people do clean that up maybe it's there overnight but by the time you're up someone's up before you and cleaned it up right pride in the city a pride in uh, the way of your little space that you've got at least around where you are so it's really remarkable that you've brought that out it's made me think again Mm. i think a lot of people come and if they're only here for a few days they have the impression that it's just people don't throw anything like it never gets dirty in the first place like it's just naturally that people in Tokyo are just naturally quite clean and they never toss their trash all over the place. But it's not the case that there's no trash ever anywhere. It's just that it's there's a huge group of people that every morning they're they're cleaning it out, right? And there's just a lot of effort on people's part to keep the city clean. 
on a daily basis so that as you walk around through the day, you don't have, don't see that. Um, Absolutely. As much. Mm. And there'll be times I've walked off a bullet train, for example, and I've forgotten to put my bottle or my, you know, pieces that I've had from uh, having eaten on the train and I haven't put them in the rubbish bin or in the garbage on the train and I've walked for ages holding on to it to find the place <laughs> that I can uh, dispose of it. You eventually find something. But that's another thing that happens is that people do not just throw it anywhere or leave it somewhere for someone else to clean up. They will take responsibility for it and dispose of it at the right place. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of, of manners associated with that. So when kids don't do it, then they get quite criticized quite happily. But yeah. there is a backup system. Of, there's someone that's coming in on, on the same concept to, to clean up all of those things. Exactly. As well. Right. Wow. That's that's some good cultural tips there and for anyone wanting to come in. What do you think then, before we head into the, the end of our podcast episode today, things coming around the corner or that you are seeing in, in law, maybe in your industry, your particular industry, you can see coming up in the next while? The biggest thing that it's being discussed right now is uh, so obviously e-discovery is very technology based technology driven um, we also develop our own ai engine um, but ours is based on language modeling so the biggest thing is chat gpt mm. which is called uh, generative ai the idea of you put in a prompt and it'll give you a kind of correct answer there are a lot of law firms in the United States, at least. And I think also in, I haven't seen any public announcements, but I do know that they are working on it in Japan as well. But sort of developing technologies that will help lawyers with their work to provide, you know, writing a memo is so intensive, right? It's so much work, but what you actually want to do is only a tenth of that, right? You you don't necessarily want to write, write each and every word. You just want to make sure that the content is correct. So a lot of developments in just legal technology in general is going, they're testing it out now, making sure that it's safe and that the training data is good training data and not, you know, just pulled randomly without any concern for privacy from the internet. There are a lot of people working in developing that, but also in our space as well, there is, I think Relativity is the biggest our platform for it. And they have announced recently a new generative AI based platform. So we'll see how that will impact um, how we do the work and what ways we will do the work. They are still in the process of just sort of testing it out and just trying out different things. You have to actually try it and see how that will actually, will it actually make your life easier or make it more difficult? Um, we will see. At the moment, you know, just the chat GP that's on the internet that everyone can access, it makes a lot of mistakes. You know, there was a case recently of someone had submitted a pleading or something that was generated by AI and the, the AI had generated fake citations. Mm. They didn't check this. Well, they tried to check the citations, but they just assumed that they didn't have access to the the case law or whatever, as opposed to its fake case law. Um, and that was submitted to a court and the court was astonished at how bad it was. So making sure that that's correct uh, there are definitely technologies coming in place that will not do that. They will always have correct citations. And that will make a lot of legal work easier, but it's still in the developing stage. So we'll see that maybe five years yeah. out. Interesting. It is astonishing what you've just said. Uh, kind of lazy to not check your citations. I think right? they, they, and not, they, not check the fake, it's fake case <laughs> law. That's just incredible. You just not, not realize that it was fake. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was astonishing. But that is a thing. People are just, you know, they're overwhelmed with the amount of work that they have to do. They want to make, take shortcuts, I guess. Shortcuts, yeah. And, you know, you're, tar you're billing by your hour, right? So it's less money for the, if we can develop and harness this technology correctly, then it's less charges for the client. You know, you can do more work more efficiently. And ideally, you can do, you can focus on the more of the things that you, you need to do, as opposed to getting that everything perfect in, in the memo to actually get the arguments right, to get the, the legal 
the lawyer stuff well and done. Yeah. I think that's going to be a huge change. Absolutely. And I certainly don't know what kind of changes um, that will provide to our industry. There's some people who are amazing at using the technology, and there's some people who just have no no idea about the technology. So I'm curious to see how it will turn out, but I definitely think it'll be a big game changer. Mm, I think so too. Is there anything today that we didn't cover that you wanted to mention or anything we might have skipped over or skimmed over that you'd like to go back to, Anitha? I just wanted to say hello to my study group because I love them very much. Um, <laughs> it was in law school. So Rob, Ashley, and Nikki there, I love them very much. They provided me so much support throughout my career. Um, they're the kind of people that, you know, I, I may not have spoken to them in, in months, but I can just sort of randomly be like, hey, I'm being asked to do this. What should I do? So they have been amazing friends that I made in law school. And they all have their own individual careers and individual personalities, but I'm always grateful for them every day. Uh, I think the only thing that I wanted to emphasize is when I was going for the Mombuko Kagakshu scholarship, I thought I was too old for it. And I spoke to my professor at my law school, Professor Kalfi, Professor Dennis Kalfi. And I asked him, do you think I'm too old to pursue this um, education? Because I was 31 or so at the time. And he said, you'll live to be 100. So you have 70 more years to go. It's plenty of time to to do everything that you want to do. And when I look back at my life, I don't have a very career-oriented life. But I've always done the things that I wanted to do. And I think that has provided me a lot of happiness and I won't say success success because I'm not a brilliant star anywhere but I'm a very happy person and I'm very happy with how my life has turned out and that I've met such great people and I have such wonderful co-workers and I have such great friends so how I pursued my life was not very career oriented but that's okay you can still have a good life that way. I think a lot of times when I was younger, it was very, a lot of anxiety for me to not have that career oriented mindset. But how do I get on with life? But there is a way to do it. Um, and, you know, things will eventually work out. So I, I wish that everyone, if they have the same concerns, just be available to the opportunities that are open to you. Wow. Okay. That was a pretty good roundup, Anitha. Really great. And you're so right. I mean, success, what does that mean? It means different things to different people. And we might have a vision in our mind what that is to win awards or to go to the top of XYZ. But happiness, my goodness, that is the most important success you could ever have in your life. And uh, I'm so glad to hear that you have that every single day. Sounds like you have a, a great atmosphere and a great place to be working and you're enjoying your life. So as we finished up, a few mm -hmm. lighter questions as well. Okay, so what's your favorite saying, Anitha, in either Japanese or English? I don't have necessarily a favorite saying, but I have a favorite word. In Japanese, there's a word called ikigai. And Catherine, you will know this, but um, it has to do with just sort of the things that make life worth living. But it's not like a big, serious thing necessarily. It could just be like a really pretty sunset could be ikigai. You know, just a, a nice conversation could be ikigai. It doesn't have to be. In, when you translate it into English, it, it becomes quite a very serious thing. It should be, you know, family or kids or, you know, your parents or or your spouse is something really big like that. But I think in Japanese, it's much more the smaller things. I think that's quite a nice thing to think about. All right. That's good. Can you share a book, since you're a bookworm, that you've read recently <laughs> that you would recommend others to read? I actually have recently reread uh, the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm a big, huge Sherlock Holmes fan. So I'm it's not quite the, the unusual off the grid book. 
Um, so I really love Sherlock Holmes, and I also love Harry Pratchett's The Discworld series. They are a fantasy series. I think that one you might not know about, but I definitely grew up on them. Uh, Sir Pratchett has unfortunately passed away, but his daughter is maintaining the, the estate, and they are still producing new content for it. And it's just a wonderful comedic look at various different things like you know, what's the value of a policing system? What's the value of politicians and things like that? But it's funny and it's lighthearted and it's just always great to reread, you know, however many dozens of times. So my best books to recommend would be like the Sherlock Holmes series by Arthur Conan Doyle and the Discworld series by Sir Terry Pratchett. Brilliant. Okay. If you were not doing your current role, what would you be doing? I think... Because I was originally a teacher, I think something like training or education or something, maybe not a public school teacher, but some kind of teaching people things. Mm -hmm. When I was a teacher, every day was fun. Every day was great. I really loved my, my job. So, And I still find a lot of value in teaching people stuff. I do a lot of training at my company, current company, but... I think something like that would be what I would eventually have landed into. I don't know that I would have started off being like, hey, I want to be your your corporate trainer person. I probably would have started in something else, develop an expertise, and then look for opportunities to teach that. Wow. Okay. What's something about you a lot of people don't know? So A lot of people know that I like anime and Coca-Cola, but I think <laughs> most people don't know I grew up listening to country music, I think. Yes. Really? I did not know that. I think it's unexpected because I'm Indian American, so I, I'm not sure what kind of music I'm supposed to have listened to. But It's um, a free country, right? It's America. a free country. You can do that. You wow, can, there you, you go. You know, there's, there's Australian country musicians for sure. Um, I'm sure. I'm surprised at how popular the genre is outside of the United States, actually. Yeah. Yeah, but um, yeah, I grew up on listening to country music, so there I think, most, and I still that's still my favorite genre of of music. So I think that's mm. something that most people don't know okay. about me or Good expect. <laughs> Two more things. First question yes. is: If you were given an opportunity to spend a day with someone, who would that mm. be, and why? Ooh, ooh, I'm fun for sure. Maybe like a a manga artist. Go, yeah, manga artist. Yeah, I, I would love to be able to see the inside workings of something, you know, like an animation studio or a, or a manga artist, Atli, Atlier. How do you say that? <laughs> Atlier. I think that would be interesting to see, to see how that person's job goes for, for a whole day. I think it's quite difficult. But right. sort of, I would rather, you know, silently watch on the sides and, I could do that without bothering them, then that would be great. Awesome. And last question is if you had a if I had a magic wand and I could give mm -hmm. you a talent, what would you most like to have? If I could play the piano. Oh, right. <laughs> I should have to ask for a superpower, I guess, instead. No. no. I've always wanted to learn how to play the piano. Well, yeah. there you go. And not that I'm, you know, too old or there's no opportunity to learn or anything like that, but I just have never managed to, to do it yet. Remember but, that question you asked when you were going for the Mamba show? The age thing. Yeah, no, no, I definitely am mm. not definitely not for uh, as a hobbyist, um, <laughs> as a hobby, you know, not a professional pianist. Then, you know, it's definitely not too late, but I haven't pursued it yet. Could try. Well done. Okay, those were very exciting. Thank you so much, Anitha. We've come to the end today. I thank you so much for being brave and coming on the Lawyer On Air podcast. It was a real pleasure to speak with you in this way, which is different to the other ways we engage, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me, Catherine. For people who are interested in connecting with you and learning more about your discovery, anime, and any of the other things you've talked <laughs> about, where, what's a good way to do that? Would you like them to come to me first and send them on to you? Or would you like to connect on uh, LinkedIn or anywhere? They can connect with me on, on LinkedIn for sure. That's fine. They don't have to go through you. 
Oh, good. Okay, then. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a, sometimes a cushion, right? But anyway, yeah, that is so yeah. fantastic. We'll put your LinkedIn uh, address in the show notes. And to anyone who has listened and really enjoyed this episode, leave a review on our website, leave a review on Apple or Spotify, whichever podcast player you're using and just tell us and we also really appreciate if you share the episode with someone else you think would be inspired to lead a lawyer extraordinaire life just like Anitha thank you so much to everyone we'll see you on the next episode cheers come pie and bye for now thank you so much for listening today to this episode of lawyer on air I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. Please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I invite you to connect with me to talk more. Jump on over to LinkedIn or Instagram where you can find me or send me a message via my website contact page. That's all from me today. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer On Air. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now.